Vivi, good morning. Thank good morning, you. Benjamin. Thank you very much for being with me today and for sitting to interview. I'm looking forward to bringing a little bit about your personal background and some of the initiatives on which we're working to the attention of the listener and of the viewer. And what I'd like to do is begin with a little bit about your personal background so that people can have the pleasure of getting to know you, as I have gotten to know you, quite frankly, because it's a unique story. So, first of all, let's begin with where were you born, where were you raised, and why were you raised in those places? Okay, I was born in Jerusalem. My father's family has lived in Jerusalem for 15 generations. Mm -hmm. My mother's family uh, survived the Holocaust and uh, on the eve of Israel's independence immigrated uh, to Israel from Bulgaria. My father has worked for years in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, he was Israel's ambassador in Turkey, in Chile and in Colombia. Mm. So I got to spend most of my youth uh, outside of Israel. From the first 18 years of my life, 15 years uh, were spent uh, abroad. So, so the first 15 years of your life were spent abroad, and, and where specifically was that period spent? Well, immediately after I was born, uh, my parents arrived to Italy. So my first year I spent uh, two and a half years actually I spent in Rome. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to Africa, to Ivory Coast, for another two and a half years. I returned for a short period of time to Israel. And then, once again, we moved, this time, to South America. Mm -hmm. I arrived at the age of seven to Chile, uh, at the time of Pinochet. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a harsh time uh, for Absolutely. the country. Uh, I was educated there in a, an American school uh, for two years. And from there, we moved to Argentina. So, so throughout this journey or this odyssey, how many languages did you manage to pick up? How many do you speak today? Well, at the age of five, I spoke three languages, uh, Italian, French, and Hebrew. That's incredible. Then I arrived to Chile, a Spanish-speaking country, in an American school. Mm -hmm. So these three languages didn't help me at all. <laughs> I learned two new languages. So I, by the age of seven, I spoke five languages. So you're moving around from country to country as the son of a diplomat, quite an, a very esteemed diplomat, actually, as I understand it. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of getting to know him somewhat as you've introduced him to our work and to our initiatives. And I am somebody who moved to the state of Israel and enlisted as what's called a chayal boded, a lone soldier. Now, a lone soldier is oftentimes thought of as being somebody who doesn't have Israeli parentage. But that's not the case. You are a lone soldier yourself. Tell me how it was that you made the decision to enlist, and then we'll go on to perhaps how you built such an illustrious career there. Well, as an Israeli, it was obvious that I would go back to Israel and enlist. Uh, at the age of 15, I arrived to Rome once again. There I was educated in a British school, and my friend in school used to ask me, how long will you serve in the army? My straight answer was four years. I knew from the beginning that I'm going to be an officer in the army and that at the age of 18 I will go back to Israel and enlist. And you wanted to be an officer, was that because with your background and being conversant in so many languages, were you determined to be a combat officer or did you think that you might go into the foreign relations branch of the IDF? What, what was open to you and what were you passionate about? Well, at high school I, I dealt with two main things. I composed classical music, I sang in a choir <laughs> and I played the piano. This is a big part of uh, my life and I thought at the time that I would be a professional uh, musician. At the same time, I was also a house captain uh, in the British high school. Now let, let's just stop there because that I grew up in the United Kingdom and it's no small thing for a, a Jewish boy, let alone an Israeli Jewish boy, to become a house captain. So. You must have been quite an exceptional character within the high school environment. I think that at the time I didn't really realize how big deal it was. I, I arrived at the age of 15 to this British high school, uh, St. George's English School in Rome. At the age of uh, 16, one year later, I was a vice house captain. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, in my last year of school, I was asked to be the house captain. By the way, my house won all the tournaments throughout <laughs> the year in these two years. Excellent. So I experienced leadership at a young age, but I was also deeply engrossed in music. 
And when I came back to Israel, I had to decide which way to go, music or leadership. And once I joined the combat engineers, it mm -hmm. was clear to me that it's going to be leadership. And so you joined the Israel Defense Forces. Your parents are living outside of the country. And you begin this career in the Israel Defense Forces, as you said, in the combat engineers. And then tell me about some of the positions that you've held within the IDF. Well, as you know, in the IDF, everybody starts as a simple soldier. Mm -hmm. So did I. My first year was quite difficult for me. Why, why was that? Well, first of all, as you said, I was a lone soldier. My parents still uh, were in Rome. Uh, at the time, they came back only a year later. Mm -hmm. uh, it also was a cultural shock coming from a diplomatic background uh, to real Israeli uh, harsh life. Right. It's, it was a complete shock to me. It took me time to adjust, to understand the language again. You know, things change very fast in Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, to meet the whole Israeli society, I didn't know it as well as I know now. And you're there, the four years come and go. What makes you take the decision to spend more time in the military? Was there a specific event? Was there a specific set of opportunities? What did it come down to? Well, when I became an officer, uh, I was honored to receive command of a platoon of 30 soldiers. And it was the most amazing and special year of my life, leading soldiers in a battlefield and in training. Uh, it felt to me like the most important uh, thing I ever, I've ever done. And, and I felt I was good at it and I, I can do even more. And so your career progresses from there. Tell us about some of the positions that you held along the way to becoming a Brigadier General. Well, I was a platoon commander, a company commander. I commanded uh, three different companies. Uh, later on, uh, I was a battalion commander. I commanded a battalion of combat engineers of uh, over 800 uh, soldiers. Uh, quite a difficult period of time. I started my command in 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, very difficult and complex right. time. Right. Uh, throughout uh, the two years, between 2002 and 2004, we operated uh, mainly in Judea and Samaria and also uh, on the northern border. Can you just give the listeners a little bit of context about what was going on at that time? Well, in April uh, 2004, Israel uh, started the uh, operation, um, it's called in English? Uh, defensive Shield. Okay. So in 2004, Israel, Israel started Operation Defensive Shield, and exactly at the beginning of this operation, uh, I, I got the command of uh, the Combat Engineers Battalion. So I commanded the battalion in this operation, and uh, it took more than two or three years after the operation to manage and control uh, the burst of terror that we saw at the time. We conducted for ev every night operations in different cities uh, in Judea and Samaria, apprehending uh, suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. And only in 2004, 2005, uh, we managed to bring back the situation uh, to be a normal situation uh, in Israel. And then you continue beyond 2002, beyond 2004, and what were some of the positions that you held subsequently? And talk to me about where your career ended and when, if you would. Well, after uh, my position as a battalion commander, uh, I became aide-de-camp of the general chief of staff, uh, Lieutenant General Bogi Ayalon. Uh, it took me all the way from the field uh, to the general uh, staff, uh, government, well, what are some of the complexities of holding that position as opposed to being in the field? You're now essentially the right hand of the Chief of Staff for the Israel Defense Forces. Can you educate me about some of the specific distinctions that you had to really get used to and become accustomed to in that capacity? Well, first of all, it's a completely different uh, position. Uh, you have to deal with all the generals. You have to deal with the office of the Minister of Defense. You have to deal with the office uh, of the Prime Minister of Israel. 
The intelligence offices, I of assume, course, as well. Uh, I used to go every morning. I would arrive at uh, half past five in the morning to the office, read all the intelligence uh, that came in uh, during the day and the night, uh, being informed about all the operations and everything that happened. Uh, sometimes in the middle of the night deciding uh, whether I have to wake up uh, Lieutenant General or not. Sometimes taking decisions for him, uh, knowing that uh, I'll have to explain in the morning why <laughs> I took the decisions and so didn't wake him up. You'd be very sure of your decisions before yes, taking them. Yes, you need them. to be very sure okay. when you are asked uh, whether some uh, Air Force planes need to be sent somewhere in the middle of the night or not. And you're making these decisions in this capacity as aide de camp. Now, how old are you at that time? I was uh, 35 years old. That is a tremendous amount of responsibility that I think, frankly, most people go a lifetime without ever encountering. So you're making all of these decisions. By the way, what's the bigger decision, letting the chief of staff sleep or waking him up? Well, waking, waking him up is a big decision, and, and I think that uh, during the time I was in this position, I woke him up, I think, only once. Okay, so we'll see whether you're at liberty to talk about that particular decision, but tell me, what was he like? What was he like to work for? How approachable, how personable was he? Well, uh, Lieutenant General Lebogi Elon is a very, very special person, very honest, very sharp very courageous. Uh, I've seen him uh, taking decisions, uh, harsh, very, very difficult decisions, uh, that very few people uh, would have the courage to take. Uh, I, I consider myself as a person, person who is not afraid to take decisions, but when I si sat beside him and saw him taking decisions, I asked myself uh, several times whether I would have the courage to to take the same decisions. Do you think that being there with him at the age that you were impacted on your decision-making ability? Do you think that that's something that he mentored you on? Or was that there innately within you? Yeah, it had a great impact on me. And so he mentored you in a number of different ways, including how to take decisions, how to manage situations and so forth. And are you able to speak about the one occasion that you woke him up? Yeah, well, actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's mainly special operations uh, issues. Okay. But you're looking at these intelligence briefings, and you mentioned earlier they're coming in on a daily basis. How often are you having to review intelligence sources, points of information, and so forth? And how much of that goes directly to the chief of staff thereafter from you? First of all, it depends who is the chief of staff. Uh, Lieutenant General Bogi Eloni, he, he was uh, really passionate about intelligence. He wanted to read intelligence all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted the source, really, not somebody telling him what he thinks about uh, the intelligence. He mm -hmm. wanted to know really what exactly was the information that came. So throughout the day, he would read the uh, different uh, intelligent messages that uh, were sent. And it's ongoing. It's 24-7 all the time. New information that needs to be assessed, sometimes very fast. Mm -hmm. And this is all uh, while commanding the whole army and uh, meeting with uh, different uh, armies around the world and commanding operations and special operations. Uh, it's, it's a very busy uh, position. And who were some of the other characters that you saw and met with in that capacity? Were there figureheads from government? Were there leaders from overseas? Can you talk about some of Well, those? it was senators, congressmen, uh, other lieutenant generals from all over the world who were really interested about Israeli know-how. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to learn from the IDF. So these people were coming into the offices of the chief of staff, not necessarily to teach, but rather to learn from the best practices here. Yes, definitely, definitely. We, we are a very experienced army, um, and the, the way things are being learned here, uh, ev everywhere in the world people want to know how things are done in the IDF. Mm -hmm. What's the lessons, what's the new lessons learned, and how to use this uh, knowledge in their armies. 
And, and what was the rapport like between General Yalon and his counterpart from the United States or from other countries? Did it often come down to a personal rapport, whether there was a liking between the two individuals, or, or does it go beyond that, or is it a combination of the two? It's definitely a combination. Okay. And uh, Lieutenant General Yalon was a very likable person. He's funny. Mm -hmm. He has good jokes. Okay. <laughs> He's very sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody was really happy to, to meet him in, uh, in every occasion. I think that one of the most special uh, events, personally, I, I had is I flew, t I flew with him to several countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in one occasion we flew to Turkey. We visited the Turkish army. And of course uh, we had a dinner at the ambassador's house. Mm -hmm. At the time it was my father. That's right. So I found myself in an official dinner uh, with uh, the general chief of staff at my parents' house. Oh, that's a fabulous dynamic. Yeah, that was great. And after you concluded that position as the aide de camp, you continued to climb the ranks and you retired ultimately at the rank of brigadier general. And your last position within the Israel Defense Forces was the senior auditor of the Israel Defense Establishment. So that's the military, that's the civilian sector, and the intersection between the two. Can you outline some of your responsibilities? And, and in fact, there's an interesting context out of which that position grew. Can you give us a little bit of that context as well? Well, this is a very, very unique position. It's the only position a part, a part of the Minister of Defense that is able to see the whole Israeli defense establishment, which means the army, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Defense, and the military industries, and overview all these uh, different uh, parts of the defense establishment, and take big issues like uh, major projects. Everybody is talking about uh, the submarines now. Mm -hmm. This is an example of a major project. Uh, that uh, has been uh, dealt in the, in the army, in the Ministry of Defense, and in the industry, of course. So uh, we audited uh, major projects, uh, we audited readiness, mm -hmm. and, and we audited... Combat readiness. Combat readiness, okay. uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Defense. So we need to think what interests the Ministry of Defense, what would be important for him and mm -hmm. for the government, and then audit. And who's the Minister of Defence at the time that you held that position? Well, two months after I was appointed uh, to this uh, position, uh, once again, General Yalon was right. uh, appointed as Minister of Defence uh, and I was very, very pleased and uh, had the chance to work with him uh, once again. So you became the Senior Auditor for the Israel Defence Establishment. You are answerable to the Minister of Defence, Moshe Yalon. Now, that means by definition he's a politician, but there are a lot of people who say about him that he operates in accordance with a series of inner guidelines that are not typical of the average politician. Is that your experience with him? Yes, this is definitely my experience. I think that uh, General Yalon is a professional. He acts accord to professional uh, issues and not politic issues. And that's what guides him, that's what helps him to make his decisions at the end of the day more than political considerations. Definitely, yes. And, and so you continue in that capacity, ultimately you retire. In what year did you retire in, 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 uh, from the Israel? 2016. Defense okay, 2016. And then... You well, actually, the retirement was at in 2017, in April 17, but uh, we have a few months of uh, vacation before we retire. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy your vacation? Very much, yes. Okay, good. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, given your background in the combat engineers, is, is something that really came to light in 2014 in Operation Protective Edge, which was that the combat engineers really ended up being on the cutting edge, on the front line, frankly, of the combat dynamic because of the advent and the use of the terror tunnels. Where is the combat engineers as a brigade today? What are the adjustments that they've had to make? And, and what was it like knowing that they were going to have to undertake this tunnel warfare in such an intensive fashion? Well, the adjustment the uh, combat engineers had undergone started long ago. 
uh, since they are in the front line, uh, they understood that they need two things. They need the infantry capabilities. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to engage uh, with the enemy while dealing uh, with the ground or with tunnels uh, or with infrastructure. And they need to be armored. And uh, since uh, 1973, since the Yom Kippur War, uh, the combat engineers have undergone major changes. Uh, unlike most of the combat engineers in the world, they don't deal anymore with logistics. They don't build bases. Uh, um, is that pontoon like bridge, there was the famous pontoon bridge. Is that the combat? They do build bridges. Okay. But not, uh, they, don't, they don't deal with uh, everyday logistics. They, they, don't build, uh, they don't deal with electricity, and uh, they don't deal with the uh, water supply, and other things that the engineers do deal with in uh, other countries. In Israel, we decided that the engineers will be only combat engineers. And, and were you part of that change? Were you part of the command and the implementation of that change at all? Yes, of course. I, I felt that change as a, already as a soldier in '87. Mm -hmm. uh, there we were told uh, you are coming to a unit that is uh, infantry and engineers. Mm -hmm. It was very important at the time for the combat engineers to, to say we are also infantry. Um, but as time went by, uh, the, the issues combat engineers had to deal with were so complex that we find ourselves more and more dealing with the uh, the world of a combat engineers and uh, less with other issues, but we have very uh, capable soldiers uh, fighting uh, the ability to fight, and they are very well protected in armored uh, APCs. So you're saying that the combat engineers are a fighting force in every sense of that idea, similar to the infantry and so forth. Uh, they are a fighting force, and uh, they are growing. Uh, part of the fighting force all the time. Today, the combat engineers core is as big as the armored core, which is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. This is a complete change. Uh, in the Second World War, uh, for every 10 tanks, you had one uh, combat engineer APC. Mm -hmm. Now they're the same size. Because <laughs> of the complexity of uh, tunnels, of dealing with infrastructure in urban areas, with the uh, bombs, with mines, mm -hmm. uh, and with there's IDs. And there's an, there's an elite unit in the combat engineers known as Yalom. What makes them elite and how do they operate? Well, they are elite in... Uh, one of the reasons we need an elite unit is we have other elite forces. And when elite forces operate in uh, different scenarios, they need engineers with them, and they need engineers who have elite capabilities. Uh, so Yalom was created uh, at the beginning to, to assist elite units. Uh, then as time went by, uh, we find out that we need these capabilities also in uh, the regular brigades. And today, each brigade, whether it's an armored brigade or an infantry brigade, when they operate, uh, in a scenario like Gaza, they will have elements of uh, Yalom with embedded within uh, the units. S so, unlike many of the elite forces within the Israel Defense Forces, it sounds as though members of Yalom actually get supplanted to work alongside other elite units as they undertake their operations. So they have to be highly adaptable, I presume, and they have to be highly capable. And they also have to be able to, to work and, and, and uh, almost take on whatever the, the best methods are of the force they're fighting as part of. Is, is that correct? Am I understanding? Yeah, it that? is. I mean, for a good example would yeah. be that uh, when uh, the Navy, Israeli Navy SEALs, yes. they had its mm -hmm. uh, when they took over uh, one of uh, the ships in the middle of the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, mm -hmm. they are embedded with them. Uh, Yalom uh, soldiers who had to deal with the explosives mm -hmm. and uh, check what what was on that uh, boat. So they need to operate in sea with the, the seals and they need to operate in 
maybe other countries uh, with special units and in, in Gaza, everywhere. General Avivi, looking more broadly at the state of Israel and its place within the Middle East, there's an ongoing debate about whether or not there are existential threats that the state of Israel faces today. And there are also very strong voices that say, actually, the state of Israel does not face any existential threat from anywhere. What's your view on those two opinions? Where do you fall in that conversation? Well, I believe that at the moment, talking about now, uh, there is no specific existential threat, but if we do bad decisions, we might find ourselves very, very fast dealing with existential threats. The potential of existential threats exists. It might be in the future a nuclear Iran. Mm -hmm. It might be, God forbid, an open corridor of terror from uh, all the Middle East into the heart of uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, so there is a potential. Uh, and uh, what Israel should be doing is making sure that this uh, potential doesn't come to be. We need to take the right decisions for, for ourselves. And can you just define, so that everybody understands precisely what you mean when you talk about an existential threat? You're not speaking about a terror attack, as dreadful as that might be. You're not even speaking about a wave of terror. You're speaking about something else. What is it that you're speaking of? When I try to imagine what would be an existential threat uh, for Israel, it could be one of two uh, scenarios. In the past, we had three scenarios. The third scenario was a big army full of uh, armored uh, units and tanks and artillery invading and conquering the land of Israel. Specifically at the moment, maybe it would change in the future, but specifically and the, uh, in this moment, there is no such army threatening the state of Israel. Today we see a different scenario. On the one hand, we see potential nuclear weapons in the hands of uh, terrorist regimes. And on the other hand, we see what we see today uh, in overall the Middle East. It's uh, terrorists uh, that destabilize countries and make them collapse. I mean, the question whether a country can collapse, I think that we can see all over the Middle East countries collapsing. Yemen, uh, Iraq, Syria, Libya, it's happening. Mm -hmm. Who could have imagined 10 years ago that we, see, we, we will see one day these countries collapsing? They are collapsing. So basically, if we create a situation where the same scenario that is happening now in Syria can happen inside Israel, this would be an existential threat. And we should be thinking about it when we take decisions, what kind of uh, solutions we are looking for. Do you think it is being thought about? I think it is. But uh, I must say that I'm worried uh, when I look at Israeli society. Uh, people don't tend to really go into details and understand uh, the issues that we have to deal with when talking about Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Um, politicians uh, tend many times to speak in very general uh, way and there is no uh, real serious uh, discussion in Israeli society about these issues. How would you bring about a more in-depth discussion? How, what would you like to see in that sense? Well, I would like um, people to put the main interests that the Israeli people have and see how uh, these interests meet or deal with uh, different solutions concerning uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I can, say that, I can say that in the social media, uh, and I tend to read uh, what everybody writes, um, there is a discussion. Uh, but uh, in the mainstream media, there is no serious discussion at all. Mm. But uh, it only big words and 
thing that you can't really work with, you know, it's not, not serious. I'd like to turn to another subject that we haven't covered because you're a citizen today, we've spoken about that. You're a, an officer by profession, but you're also, of course, a father. Now, you're a father of how many children? Well, four children. Uh, I have two big children and two young children. Uh, and it's my second marriage, so my wife and I have three more children. So uh, in our house, we had seven children growing up. You have seven children growing up. Now, yeah. let, let me ask you this. As a citizen and as an officer and as a general, what does service in the Israel Defense Forces mean to you in the context of your children? Well, all my big children now uh, are either serving, some of them already as officers, mm -hmm. or ended service, or are going to join service uh, in the next uh, coming year. And I really hope, uh, talking about my young kids, that they, they will find a different world. A world where um, there is agreement, there is peace, uh, I think that uh, military life uh, is not easy. They have to deal in a very young age with uh, issues that are quite uh, complex. Uh, on the other hand, they, um, they get to do things that young people usually don't do. They command, they lead people, uh, they get a lot of responsibility. And this is what makes the youngsters in Israel so great and so successful afterwards, afterwards in uh, their lives. So as, as many people know, the IDF operates by way of a conscription service, that people are drafted at the age of 18 shortly after graduating high school. Is national service a burden or an asset when it comes to the broader Israeli society and how they grow and develop thereafter? Yeah, I think it's definitely an asset. Why? Tell, tell me why that is. Well, you take young people and bring them to a place which gives them values, uh, trust them uh, with a lot of responsibility, uh, takes them from their video games and uh, everyday uh, issues to national uh, issues. Uh, and people, when they finish uh, the military service, they're, they're different people, they're better people. Uh, they get to know all the Israeli society, they get to uh, interact with very different people maybe that they met during their young life. Because it's this melting pot? Yes, exactly. And, and you said that you hope that your children will know a time that's different to the formative years that you experienced, that they'll know a time of peace with their neighbours and so forth. That's your hope. Is it your belief, though? Do you think that that will be the case? I consider myself a very realistic uh, person. Um, and I believe uh, that there could be reached agreements um, that both sides will benefit from. Uh, but I also believe uh, that in this world you need to be strong always and ready because changes um, are really fast. And I don't know why people are always surprised by the fact that uh, history keeps changing uh, all the time. I mean, just look at the last 10 years, it's incredible. The whole world has changed completely. The world is changing all the time. Sometimes it's for the better and sometimes it's for the worse. And you need to be ready all the time for all scenarios. This is the only way to thrive. Mm. Are we thriving here in the States of Israel? In well, I think we are. Israel is extremely successful. I mean, I... I from my perspective today, um, when I was 18, uh, I remember my friends in high school uh, asking me, they didn't know Israel at all, and they used to ask me questions like, hey, do you still drive with camels? Or maybe the only thing we could be really proud about was the uh, Jaffa oranges. Mm -hmm. Today everybody looks up at Israel and wants to be in touch uh, with the state of Israel and learn from our uh, experience in technology in the economy, in the military. And this is a huge change from what I saw when I was uh, young. I'd like to ask you just two questions that I think you're almost uniquely placed to speak about. So you grew up as an Israeli living in the diaspora, and you spent your adult life 
as a commander of Israelis in the state of Israel. What's the distinction within yourself that you noted as a Jew in the diaspora versus as a Jew in the state of Israel? Is there a distinction? And if so, what does it come down to? How would you describe that? It doesn't matter how many friends I had when I lived in Italy or in Argentina. I always had the feeling that uh, it's, not, it's not my home, not my place, and uh, it's not really the place I feel comfortable in. And only in the state of Israel, it's the only place I feel really at home. And what would be your message? I know that I said that the previous question was my last question, but I'll push it, push it just a little bit further. What would be your message to the, the broad uh, span of the Jewish diaspora when it comes to how you would like them to look upon and to engage with the state of Israel? Well, first of all, uh, I have lots of Jewish friends in the diaspora, and today when they ask me, what can we do for Israel? Uh, I say to them, look, really the only thing that Israel needs is more Jews. We need our brothers in the diaspora to make Aliyah and join us. To and this. sisters. And brothers and sisters, of Absolutely. course. Uh, from the diaspora to join this exceptional, uh, successful country and, and build their life here. Uh, and I believe that today the situation is more about how, what Israel can do for the Jewish diaspora and not what the Jewish diaspora can do for Israel. And this is good news. This is good news for the Jewish people. And do you, do you view it as a partnership, as a, as, a, as a partnership of value and virtue between the Jews within the states of Israel and the Jews in the diaspora? We are one people. I'm Israel. It's one nation, one people. There is no Jews and, and other Jews. It's one Jewish nation. Um, and I think we have to do what was expected from us to do from the beginning, to come back to our uh, homeland and live together here. And General Avivi, when you think about individuals of the Jewish faith who live outside of the states of Israel, individuals of other faiths, and individuals who don't ascribe to any particular faith whatsoever, but who worry about the states of Israel, what would be your message to them? First of all, I say don't worry, we're doing fine. I'm very optimistic. We talked about different threats, and, but the future of Israel is bright. Uh, and Israel, every day that goes on, is becoming a stronger and stronger light throughout the world, bringing its know-how, its technology, its values all over the world. And th this is what uh, the Jewish people from the beginning uh, has been assigned to, to be a light in this world. General Avivi, thank you so very much for your time. Thank you for letting us get to know you. Thank you for letting me get to know you. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.